I moved to the city for college and resided in the school dormitory. That night, while I was going around the dormitory, I saw a lot of smoke. Someone was burning something and the scent of smoke made me cry. Going a bit further, I noticed an old lady in an alley near the dormitory burning just paper on the ground. Curiosity peaked. I opened my eyes to take a closer look because she appeared to be doing something other than burning just paper. She was wearing slippers and was continuously banging on something. That was strange to me since I'd never seen anything like it before. Curiosity caused me to pause and take a closer look since she sat with her back to the entrance and I wondered what she was doing. So I lifted my body to improve my vision. The more I stared at it, the more terrified I became. The old lady kept banging on the item while murmuring as if she was casting a spell which was terrifying. And then I realized what she was striking on was a paper doll. It was carved in the shape of a human laid on the ground and beaten mercilessly. I mustered the guts to approach her and listen to what she was saying. She abruptly turned around and stared at me, her expression frightening. I was startled and terrified at the moment because I was afraid of what she would do to me. So I hurried out of there. I was not sure why I was so afraid of an old woman. Out of the alley there were many other people sitting on the street doing the same thing which made me ponder a lot at this time. I'd been walking for a while thinking all the way and arrived to the dorm without noticing. When I arrived at my room my roommate Yan saw that I was sweating and taunted me whether I had just returned from a date with my girlfriend that I looked so weary. I immediately wiped away my perspiration, recovered my calm and informed them that I had just witnessed something terrifying. Then I told them what I had seen earlier. On the contrary to what I expected, when I finished, he stated that this was a typical activity. Seeing this, I inquired more directly about the questions that had been bothering me all along. He said it was an annual ceremony to eliminate inducement curses which the elders generally performed for their offspring. I was even more perplexed after hearing that since I had no idea what an inducement curse was or why it was performed around this dormitory. Yan told me a story that he had heard and observed here at the time. I was much more terrified now since I had heard him mention that there was an enchantment with dolls in the dormitory previously. He lighted a cigarette slowly and reminisced about a year ago. He was in the same room as the other boys at the time including two called Zin and Bing. They were cleaning the room as usual that day when Zin walked in from outside. Hey, did you just get dumped by your girlfriend? Your face looks like a leftover dumpling, said Bing. But Zin was different that day. He pushed Bing aside and ordered Bing not to bother him in an irritated tone. He then went directly to bed. Normally he would never raise his voice in front of his buddies. Yan soothed Bing, then stated that Zin must be exhausted. He didn't mean anything bad. Zin screamed loudly as Yan and Bing were about to turn and go away. Panicked, they turned back and saw Zin clutching his head and crying in agony. It was becoming increasingly short, as if he was in a great pain. Yan and Bing saw this and dashed over to have a look. Then they both became incredibly shocked and panicked by what they witnessed. There were large and tiny holes bleeding on Zin's forehead right now. Those holes were progressively becoming larger, more painful and deeper, much like being pricked with a cigarette. Zin writhed on the bed, holding his head and crying out in anguish. He stopped screaming after a while and seemed to be less painful, but his face looked exhausted. When Yan and Bing noticed this, they immediately inquired about his situation. Zin stated that he had been exhausted and in agony since proposing to break up with his girlfriend. Sometimes he had stomach ache, sometimes a headache, and every time he went to see the doctor, the doctor said he was normal.
and couldn't find any problem. Before he finished speaking, he hastily held his arm, this time because it hurt. What was frightening was that his arm began to twist horribly. I twisted until it began to shatter and turn 360 degrees. You could painly hear bones fracturing one by one. Yan didn't know what to do when he saw that in front of him since everything happened all of a sudden. Zin cried in agony. His entire arm was rotated entirely the other direction, making it appear so scary. He painfully gripped his arm and cried. It was horrible to witness this sight right now. Yan believed this was most likely due to someone enchanting him and Bing agreed. His face was pallid, like a lost soul, and his eyes were filled with blood-red veins. Then he lay down, covered in blankets, threw everyone out and stated he was okay and there was no need to call an ambulance. Because there was an exchange program at the dormitory that night, everyone gathered in a huddle. Everyone gathered in the yard to chat and discuss about their adventures. Suddenly, Yan and Bing overheard some girls who were friends of Zin's lover chatting. Zin's girlfriend seemed to have locked herself in a room all day following their breakup, causing her friends to be concerned as well. Hearing that, Yan and Bing assumed that because they had broken up, it was so sad that it had occurred so terribly. Bing took advantage of the situation. He had a long-standing crush on Zin's girlfriend. So he purchased a box of cakes and went to the girl's room. When he arrived he saw that the room's door was ajar and that there was a weird noise within. Bing peered inside by mistake. But he couldn't see clearly. So Bing looked through the glass on the door and was going to call her. But on the inside, the girl was sitting on the bed and performing strange things. She grabbed a rag doll and stabbed it repeatedly with something. It turned out that she had punctured the doll's entire forehead with a needle, leaving holes on it. The cloth doll also resembled Zin. She then began to break its legs and limbs out of anger. The doll's arm progressively broke off and finally fell off, twisting and appearing odd. Her face was pallid with malicious purpose and her lips were muttering something extremely frightening. Finally, she rose up and opened the window to the room. Dumping the doll out of the window as if she was about to throw it on the ground. She read something on her lips before throwing it. And as she let go the doll tumbled down. Bing was terrified after seeing everything. So he didn't dare to knock on the door. Then he turned to find Yan, planning to tell him everything. But as soon as he walked down to the yard, he noticed a big crowd. Bing heard from the crowd that someone had committed suicide by leaping from a building which corresponded with what he had seen earlier, so he trembled a little and prayed it wasn't the case. When he walked in to take a closer look, the image in front of his eyes caused him to be scared to death. Zin was the one who leaped from the floor and his limbs were shattered much like the doll Bing had seen previously. I began to panic and worry since I hadn't been aware of such a dreadful spell and I couldn't believe that girl could do such evil things only because of a breakup. And Yan claimed that both the police and the forensics said Zin committed suicide. No one could find out anything. But at the same time, everyone in the school knew. So she moved to the other school afterwards. And the worshippers from earlier did so to break the spell on that doll with a replacement paper doll. Shen and I have been close friends since we were children. And one day while we were playing, I senselessly asked about Shen's family. Because the Shen family was the wealthiest in the area as a result of selling tofu for many generations. 
Shen stated that his great-grandfather, Jin, started his career without any resources and there was a thrilling story that had been passed down in the Shen family until now. Shen then began telling me the story. He also told me not to tell anyone about the story, which piqued my interest even more. Shen's great-grandfather, Jin, worked as a hired worker for other people when he was young. His life was very difficult and poor. Jin's daily job was simply mowing the lawn or doing other jobs that people hired him for. Jin married after a while as well. Soon after, they had a child and that was now Shen's grandfather. Because life was too difficult, Jin devised a business plan to help his family. He saved up and purchased a bag of fresh soybeans. His business plan based on a tofu recipe taught by Jin's mother in the past. He ground these beans to get water. Back in the day, people cooked milk with soybeans mainly. With Jin's heirloom recipe, the bean paste quickly solidified into a large, soft mass that looked very delicious. Jin initially offered to sell to local households, but because they were unfamiliar with the food, they only bought a little at a time. When they returned home, they could make many different delicious and nutritious dishes with the tofu and Jin's tofu gradually gained popularity. People in the area began to come to Jin for more purchases. Jin suggested to his wife that they open a small shop for business as their business grew better and better. Because their business was going well, because their business was doing well, People from other areas frequently came to place orders and Jin would deliver the tofu to them. Jin was completing an order as usual one day. He needed to transport the tofu to the next village, so Jin woke up early to prepare to go. Because there were no other modes of transportation available at the time, everything was transported by road. But when he arrived, the customer's house was closed and there appeared to be no one living in there, so Jin returned. The couple felt strange, but what concerned them more was that the tofu couldn't be stored for long, especially this was almost all of their tofu for today. But instead of giving up, Jin decided to carry the tofu around and sell it, as well as visit other villagers to see if anyone would buy it. So Jin carried the tofu to go once more. It was getting dark now. Jin had gone for a long time but only sold a few of the tofu and seeing that it was already dark, he was disappointed and was about to return. Jin then noticed from a distance a very large and extremely busy restaurant with many customers coming in and out. Jin was taken aback by how deserted the area was but this restaurant was doing exceptionally well. Jin turned to leave when he heard a voice calling him from behind. Jin quickly turned hey. around when he noticed the restaurant owner beckoning from a distance. Jin walked over to see what he needed. The owner then offered to buy all of Jin's tofu. Jin was taken aback. Why would a stranger offer to buy himself a whole basket of tofu? Hello! I'm a friend of your mother, and I heard your tofu is delicious. Just leave it all to me," said the owner. Accompanied by an invitation to join them for dinner because his restaurant was hosting a party to commemorate a special occasion today, but Jin refused, stating that all he needed to do was carry the tofu inside and return. The owner did not force him at this time. He simply told Jin to carry the tofu to the kitchen and then he could leave. Jin followed the owner inside the large house and went straight to the kitchen. The owner put his hand on Jin's shoulder just as he was about to turn around, intending to keep Jin. He explained that he wanted to invite Jin to dinner to show his admiration. Also the way back was a bit long and it was already dark and he saw Jin was very tired. Jin still refused citing the fact that his family was waiting for him at home. However, the owner was still ecstatic and pushed Jin to the table. 
Jin was pushed to a dining table with the owner's enthusiasm, and what was in front of him surprised Jin. Because there was such a feast in front of Jin right now, full of fish and meat, which were cooked very attractively, Jin couldn't resist the enticing scent of the food after carrying tofu for the whole afternoon and being exhausted as well. Seeing the increasing number of customers entering the restaurant, Jin initially planned to eat briefly and then leave. Jin devoured a chicken thigh because such a hearty meal was normally difficult to have. Jin looked around for a while of attentive eating and noted something was wrong. Jin looked at the people next to him. They didn't talk at all, and they didn't even eat. He took the initiative to start a conversation, but they did not respond. Jin reasoned that they didn't like him because he didn't pay for the meal. Looking back, the restaurant's owner was seated with other customers. Jin was a little embarrassed because he had been invited to eat such delicious food like this for free. As a result, Jin decided to bring a cup of tea to the next table to toast with the owner to thank for treating him so well. Jin attempted to speak and thank him when he arrived, but the owner did not respond. He was sitting still, neither eating nor responding to Jin. Jin noticed something odd and asked if the owner thought he was a jerk because he ate without paying. But no matter how many times he asked, the owner sat motionless. Jin took the initiative to call him because he thought it was too weird, but as soon as he walked over to touch the owner, Jin was startled by what he saw. All of the dishes on the table in front of the owner and his guests. There was no meat or fish at all, only worms and maggots on the plates. And they were still alive, crawling around on the plates and on the table. Other foods were simply soil and worms. Jin panicked at this point and the owner slowly turned around. Jin screamed in terror when a skull full of maggots appeared. Jin was so terrified and panicked. He took a step back and attempted to flee, but tripped. Jin fainted after his head hit the ground, and he had no idea what had happened. Not sure how long Jin was unconscious, but when he awoke, he saw a large crowd in front of him. He opened his eyes slowly to see better. It turned out to be his wife and some close neighbors. Jin was still in shock and was about to tell his wife what he had witnessed. The old man who lived next door quickly stopped him, preventing Jin from speaking. After that, everyone pitched in to help Jin get out of the woods. After that, everyone told Jin that because it was late at night and he hadn't returned, his wife had called some neighbors to look for him. After a while searching around, everyone found Jin lying next to a grave. With his mouth full of mud, Jin heard it and was perplexed. Had he met ghosts? Jin quickly put his hand in his pocket after recalling that they had paid him. Jin took out a bunch of dried leaves. Jin dashed over to check the tofu load because he remembered selling the tofu to those ghosts and they used the tofu in a variety of delicious dishes. And when he opened it, there was no longer any tofu inside. So what happened to the tofu in the end? Jin's family was very concerned about him after what happened, but Jin insisted that he was fine. Jin simply stated that he was tired and needed to rest. Jin vomited a lot after that because of what he ate, and everything Jin vomited up was mud mixed with tofu. Jin eventually stopped delivering and began to open a restaurant, serving dishes with tofu as the main course. The strange thing was that after that day, Jin's tofu suddenly became more popular and customers were lining up every day. Surprisingly, the idea of opening a tofu restaurant made Jin's business much more convenient. Jin's tofu had almost gotten everyone addicted and crazy. Jin believed he got this idea from his ghost encounter. 
Soon after, Jen's restaurant appeared like a kite in the wind, and it was soon able to expand into a large store, and Jen became increasingly wealthy. After hearing Shen's story, I began to have strange thoughts. That the tofu pieces my parents bought from the Shen family, which I ate every day, had anything to do with the bugs or the things Jin went through that night. This scary story happened in 2004, when I was a kid. That year, I got chicken pox. My parents asked the teacher to let me stay at home, not having to go to class. But that time, my parents had to go to the city for a week. Before leaving, they told me not to leave the house, lest I infect other children. Even though I didn't want to, I had to stay at home, just hoping for a quick recovery. I thought to myself, so I have to stay at home until this chicken pox is completely cured? I was contemplating whether to sneak out or not when I heard my grandmother call. She told me not to go out, then asked me to come in to eat dinner. So every day I had to stay at home like a prisoner. I felt bored. At that time I looked like an autistic child. I had to play alone in the front yard. While playing in the yard, I suddenly heard a group of friends calling my name outside. The sound was very familiar. So I quickly climbed up the wall to see what they were up to. I climbed up the wall and saw my friends. They were planning to spread their nets to the river to catch fish. I was never absent when we went fishing together before. And now, I felt helpless when I saw my friends having fun. My friends saw the chicken pox on my face, so they told me I wasn't cured yet. Well, you stay at home, don't come out here and infect us. After that, they left. Although I was very disappointed, there was nothing I could do about it. I regretfully watched my friends leave. But at the same time, I suddenly saw what seemed to be a figure standing in the corner on the side of the road. Even though she was hidden in the dark, I still recognized the shoes of Umi, a girl from my neighborhood. Hey. I called out to her loudly. I thought she might be hiding from the boys by standing in that corner because they often bullied and teased her. But it was strange that Umi stood motionless in the dark. No matter what I called her, she ignored me. I felt very strange because Umi liked to play with me before. When I was about to call Umi again, my grandmother came out of the house and saw that I was climbing a dangerous wall, so she hurriedly asked me to climb down. My grandmother was worried that I might fall, so she rushed over to help me climb down. I told her that I saw Umi outside and wanted to go out with her for a while, but I didn't expect my grandmother's face to suddenly change at that moment. She took me into the house, told me to turn on the TV to watch. She didn't even let me play in the yard anymore. Coincidentally, Umi's grandmother also came to our house that night. I was lying in bed and reading a book when I heard a knock on the door. My grandmother hurried out. Umi's grandmother came looking for her, not knowing if it was something important. I didn't hear what they were saying in the living room. I just saw the two grandmothers shaking their heads and sighing for a while. Something seemed to be bothering them. They talked for more than an hour, then Umi's grandmother got up to leave. Seeing that, I followed the door and asked Umi's grandmother if she could let Umi come over to play with me the following day. But I didn't know what's going on. Umi's grandmother didn't answer me but left with a gloomy face. I thought to myself that maybe she was worried because I would spread chicken pox to Umi. So she didn't want Umi to come and play with me. After a few days, I was depressed because my chicken pox still didn't heal. Staying at home drove me crazy, so I climbed up the wall to look at the people passing by. This actually made me feel a little less sad. I unintentionally turned my head and saw a person standing in the corner, 
As soon as I saw the shoes, I knew it was Umi. Hey. I happily greeted her in the most friendly way, with the same old question, but it was still the same as before. Umi was still standing there, motionless. She was still hiding in the dark, huddled in a corner like last time. No matter how I called her, there was no response. I thought maybe Umi was mad at me. I found it very strange. I wanted to know what she was doing to stand motionless for several days. So I sneaked past my grandmother to open the door and go out. When I went out, I tiptoed very softly. I also wanted to play a little prank right to startle Umi when she's not paying attention. But before I got closer to Umi, I realized that something was wrong with her. Umi was standing upright, nestled behind an electric pole. At that time, the light was a bit dim. I couldn't see her face clearly, but I could still vaguely see her face slightly dazed. I thought someone was bullying her, so she got a little sad and hid here. I called out to her and slowly approached her. As I got closer, Umi now seemed to notice me. She suddenly stared at me. At this moment, her face hidden in the shadows appeared. But when I got a good look at her, I was scared to pee in my pants. I saw that one side of Umi's face was gone. And there was a big hole in it. I had never seen such a horrible sight. I was so scared that I was speechless. My brain paused for a long time before reacting. I turned my head and ran away with a scream. I knew it wasn't Umi. Definitely not Umi. I ran home lifelessly. Umi still standing there and not chasing me. I was so scared that I could only hide in bed and I had a high fever that very night. Because I had high fever, my mother also came home quickly. That night, both my grandmother and mother were very worried about me. After tossing and turning all night, my fever disappeared the following morning and my chicken pox had also healed. Seeing that I was okay, my mother and grandmother were relieved. I quickly told them that I had seen Umi's terrible face yesterday. Grandma said that when I got chicken pox, my father took me to the hospital for a checkup. Umi had waited for me in that alley. She wanted to wait for me to come back to play with her. But suddenly, there was a truck turning in. The driver took the wrong road because of drunkenness. Therefore, he drove the car into a narrow alley. The driver failed to control the speed, and Umi was too scared not to get out in time, so she died under the wheel. When Umi died, her head happened to be sandwiched between the front of the car and the wall. The poor little girl lost half of her face. Regarding Umi's death to this day, when I think about it, I still blame myself. She died because she was there waiting for me to come back so we could play together. I personally experienced this event and it was the most terrifying memory that I would never forget. I relocated to the city in 2008 to begin my first year of college. I shared a dorm room with Chao, a buddy from our hometown. I wanted to go to the beach to play after cleaning the room, so I asked Chao, hey, do you want to go somewhere or let's go to the beach for a walk? But because Chao packed so much luggage, he didn't completely tidy his stuff and didn't want to go out, so I had to go out by myself. As a person who lived in the highlands, 
I had a great desire to see the sea and I registered in this institution because I wanted to live near the water. When I arrived at the beach, gorgeous views exceeded my expectations. I didn't anticipate the sea to be this beautiful and everything transpired in front of me as if it were a dream. The chilly sea breeze rushed past. I was able to see numerous flocks of seagulls soaring around which felt fantastic. The sound of the sea crashing on the coast followed by the sound of powerful waves gave me a completely different sensation than that enormous rivers I've witnessed. The huge sandy beach and the raging waves created an experience that was difficult to express by words. My soul was now soothed in peace. It was also late afternoon and numerous seabirds and seagulls were chirping and flying around. I still didn't want to leave. The water had sucked me in, so I strolled east on the smooth sand. There were a few huge boulders, so I took off my shoes and sat on one, looking out at the lovely seascape. The setting sun painted the water surface a brilliant crimson color. All of them were in such a harmony. That gorgeous ocean made me forget about time. Everything appeared to come to a halt. I sat for more than two hours in such awe-inspiring surroundings. I didn't get up and go until the sun had completely set and the night sea wind made me feel cold. But at this very time, I discovered a serious problem. Something piqued my interest. Many beaches and coral reefs behind me had vanished. How come they just vanished all of a sudden? It made me so curious. Then I realized that the sea fluctuated with the tides and tide level might be high by now. I was standing on this reef watching the waves rose higher and higher behind me. I calmed myself and looked cautiously gently getting into the water and saw that it was already up to my waist. Concerned that the tide might rise even sooner, I hastily raced to the coast walked into the sea without caring about my clothes getting wet and discovered another problem. I thought the waves would simply soak my pants a bit, but with only a couple more waves hitting me, drenching my entire body, I found a large cut on my foot. But I couldn't worry too much at the moment since I was so terrified and my foot was bleeding, so I hurried up to the coast. I attempted to run as fast as I could back to my dorm, trembling from the cold. Fortunately, after a few minutes, I arrived. Huh, <laughs> did you go to view the sea or did you take a swim? <laughs> You're drenched! Chow inquired, seeing that I was soaking wet. But when he spotted me passing by, he suddenly became terrified. He was trembling a look of horror on his face and he pointed at me stammering but behind you why is there a woman behind you chow claimed there was a woman with long hair wearing yellow clothes sitting on my back it was quite an unpleasant feeling but i didn't realize there was anything heavy on me which woman are you sure Chow? I unconsciously looked back after hearing Chow's remarks and there was nothing behind me. Chow sat up uneasily, looking behind me and seeing nothing. He couldn't believe he was wrong because the woman's form was clearly visible. I merely told Chow that perhaps I had caught a cold from the seawater, so I went to bed early to relax. What I believed was a cold turned out to be a virus that could have killed me if it hadn't been identified in time. I overslept that day. I developed a high fever, couldn't get out of bed for two days and experienced agony all over my body after taking the medicine which scarcely worked. My classmates rushed me to a hospital near the school for emergency treatment. 
I still have a high fever after three days of infusion in the hospital and my classmates were quite concerned. They wanted to inform my parents so that they could come to take care of me. Fortunately, on the fourth day, I was gradually improving. The fever was still present, but my mind felt much better. But that day, Chow observed something that startled him while watching TV in the school infirmary, as I was still chatting to the guy next to me. A woman's corpse discovered in the sea. A drowning accident was being reported on a local TV news show. It came out that the foreign female was trapped on the beach and died because of falling into the sea. A week later, her body was discovered on the beach and the place where the body was discovered was where I was stuck that day. Even worse, Chow noticed that the girl on TV resembled the girl whom I carried on my back the other day who had long hair and wore yellow clothing. Chow didn't complete his statement, but I had a feeling I knew what had happened. Could it be that the rock I was sitting on that day was where the girl died, and when I fell into the water, I became ensnared by the girl's ghost? I wasn't sure whether that was the case, but I didn't dare to think about it, so I told myself to try to forget. I didn't know if it was a coincidence, but when the girl's corpse was picked up, my condition progressively improved. For the following four years of my academic career, I went to the beach to enjoy the lovely landscape, but I also realized that the water, although beautiful, was also quite hazardous. The story occurred in a river which ran through my village. People frequently drowned in the area due to the fast and deep currents. At the time, there was a family who stood by the river, all with sad expressions, looking at the water and lamenting. The reason was that their son drowned while bathing in the river, so they sought the assistance of Mr. Kang who specialized in retrieving dead bodies from the river. Because it has been many hours with no results, the deceased family was concerned. All of a sudden, at the precise moment, the man pointed to the water and exclaimed loudly, Come back! Come back! With their expectant eyes, the three-person family looked down at the river. They saw Mr. Kang and his wooden boat. Mr. Kang, who had a shabby and austere face, worked as a boatman on the river as well as a body picker. The victim's family was very worried and anxiously waited for Mr. Kang's wooden boat to arrive. The boat approached the shore slowly. The river was now rising, so the boat swayed, and Mr. Kang had to work hard to keep the boat afloat. Next, Mr. Kang quickly rowed to shore. When Mr. Kang's boat docked, the victim's three family members looked at the wooden boat, worried, and the mother's face was sad. There was nothing in the dugout canoe but a fishing net. With tears in her eyes, the mother asked Mr. Kang if he could retrieve her son's body, her voice filled with pain. Mr. Kang did not respond. Instead, quietly raising his wrist, which had a rope attached to it, he stretched one end of the rope into the water while the other appeared to be tied to a heavy object and he was attempting to pull it. Mr. Kang's face became dull and solemn. He still did not open his mouth to speak, but his gaze was fixed on the river's surface. When Mr. Kang pulled the rope out of the water, a white corpse's arm was pulled out with it shocking everyone. It turned out that Mr. Kang tied the body with a rope and dragged him to the shore. According to locals here, drowning people should not be put on the boat because it would be very unlucky. Mr. Kang remained silent as he brought the body ashore. He then turned around and returned to the boat. 
As the mother witnessed the pitiful scene unfolding in front of her eyes, she sobbed and screamed as she gazed at her son's corpse. Mr. Kang was used to such scenes, and he rode away calmly. Mr. Kang's boat was about to leave the dock when a man reached out and called out to him. Mr. Kang, wait! The man presented Mr. Kang with a large sum of money in exchange for Mr. Kang retrieving their son's body. Mr. Kang on the other hand refused the money and sailed away. I'm not doing this for the money. Take care of your son's funeral well. I'm leaving. Mr. Kang did not despise money. Rather a heartbreaking incident in his past had changed his mind. Previously Mr. Kang had both rode and caught fish in the river. If there was any dead body floating in the river, Mr. Kang would also pick it up to take advantage of some extra money. The story took place five years ago. Only Mr. Kang was famous for picking up dead bodies in the river. When the body of the victim was discovered, Mr. Kang did not immediately hand it over to the victim's family, instead allowing them to kneel and beg on the shore. Because the poor couple did not have enough money to pay Mr. Kang, they prayed and pleaded with him to reduce the price to allow them to receive their son's body. So Mr. Kang thought for a while and then lowered the price. However, the price was still too high in comparison to the poor couple's family. So the old woman cried out and begged Mr. Kang to be merciful and reduce the money for them. When confronted with the situation, the old man cried out and said, I beg you. We will pay you a little in advance. The rest we will borrow and pay you later. Having said that, both the old couple continued to bow their heads to Mr. Kang, who was still holding the rope to hang their son's body and considering the old man's suggestion. Mr. Kang then agreed to accept the money and delivered the body to the old couple for them to bring it back. Mr. Kang's wife died young and the family had a daughter who married as well. Because she was concerned that her father would be alone, she would come home every weekend and took advantage of making a delicious meal for Mr. Kang. Today, having a good amount of money, Mr. Kang happily bought wine and meat ready for a delicious meal with his dear daughter. He handed his daughter the large piece of pork he was holding in his hand and told her to make the casserole. Mr. Kang's daughter was now his only source of comfort. He was overjoyed that his daughter still came here to cook for him on a regular basis. Previously, the daughter had opposed Mr. Kang's drinking, but today she not only cooked a delicious meal, but she also bought her father a bottle of good wine. Father and daughter had dinner together and told each other many amusing stories. Mr. Kang then pondered and asked his daughter, is there anything you want to tell dad? Mr. Kang's daughter just said that she was very happy because he was always healthy and happy. But she wanted to say something that she always kept in her heart. It turned out that the daughter was always opposed to her father doing the job of picking up dead bodies for wages. The villagers claimed that Mr. Kang was dishonest when he took advantage of the unscrupulous job to make money. Mr. Kang raised his face before his daughter finished speaking. He used to hear people whispering behind his back saying such things, but now even his daughter was opposed to his work. His wife died young, and he had to do everything he could to earn money to raise her. Mr. Kang didn't care what other people said, but today, hearing his daughter say that, he felt disappointed. Mr. Kang immediately stood up, enraged, and scolded his daughter for failing to sympathize with him. Mr. Kang walked out angrily after arguing with his daughter, refusing to look back even though his daughter was calling him. Mr. Kang was extremely frustrated at the time, and even his own daughter looked down on him. Mr. Kang had only taken a few steps outside when it began to rain. He felt as if God was against him. Mr. Kang walked back to the shack where he used to rest by the river in the rain. He lay in the shack with wet clothes, huddled up, and it showed that Mr. Kang was very cold and sad. He couldn't help but cry when he thought about everything that had happened 
and how much bitterness he had suffered. It kept raining continuously. Mr. Kang had no idea when he fell asleep. All of a sudden he vaguely heard the sound of rain outside the shack, mixed with his daughter's voice calling him. He got to his feet and looked outside where he saw his daughter standing in the rain calling to him. Mr. Kang ignored his anger when he saw his daughter soaking in the rain. Fearing that his daughter would catch a cold from the rain, he quickly ran out of the shack. Mr. Kang looked at his daughter as she stood outside in the rain knowing how much his heart ached. It was just that his daughter's behavior was a bit strange. She begged Mr. Kang to forgive her for her words earlier and in the end she said she had to go away so she came to see him one last time. Mr. Kang found it difficult to understand where his daughter was going as a result of these words. He was being hesitant when his daughter turned around and walked into the river. Mr. Kang rushed forward to stop her, but what he didn't expect was that his hand had already passed over his daughter's body. His hands were shaking. Standing dumbfounded, he kept calling his daughter's name. A hunch told him that his daughter had an accident and tried to come back here to see him. Mr. Kang sadly called out his daughter's name, but to no avail. The daughter went to the cold river bank. The father's heartbreaking scream was drowned out by the sound of rain, making the pain of losing a child almost interminable. From the moment Mr. Kang walked out, the daughter went along the river to find her father, but unfortunately fell into the river and drowned. From then on, Mr. Kang rode on the river to help retrieve the dead body and didn't take a penny. Today we will listen to a horror story that took place in a poor village. The entire village was abuzz about Ken's encounter with ghosts on his way of delivering goods and his friends couldn't wait to hear him tell the tale. Ken was still scared when he remembered that. One of his friends was taken aback and asked him about what the ghosts looked like. Ken said nothing and simply took another sip of wine before beginning to tell the story. That night, the warehouse where he worked received a large order from downtown. In order to secure the work, the warehouse owner who was Ken's boss immediately offered to accompany Ken to the location to check and collect money. The boss was happy to sit next to Ken to show him the way and chat with him along the way. The two dashed out of the village, taking the highway to the town. Because it was dark at the time, the road was devoid of traffic. Ken, however, wanted to finish work early so he could go home and rest, so he drove around the shortcut to get to the town faster. He carried the goods into the warehouse for the purchaser to check when he arrived. Also. He was kind enough to assist him in reordering the goods into the warehouse. The purchaser rewarded him with a separate commission for his diligence and hard work. Everything went swimmingly. Ken continued to drive his boss back to the village after completing his work. The two were sitting in the truck happily conversing with each other. The boss also shown that she appreciated Ken a lot. While their truck was turning to the village road, they saw a young woman was huddled on the side of the road. Despite the fact that she saw Ken's truck approaching, she did not rush to get up. Her behavior was unusual. He was surprised and confused. He wasn't sure whether he should pull over to help this girl. While he was thinking about it, the boss suggested that she would get out of the truck to have a look. This girl might be lost. The boss hastily went down, walking alone to where the girl was sitting, as soon as she finished speaking. With a kind expression, the boss gently asked her a few questions. Ken sat quietly in his truck, fearing of robbers might have jumped out from both sides of the road. But the robbers were nowhere to be found, leaving only the strange girl sitting motionless with her face down. The boss continued to question her. 
But she did not respond, nor did she show any emotion. She appeared to be deaf. As a result, the boss motioned for the girl to get into the truck and follow her home. The girl then raised her eyes, revealing a pale, cold face. Then, without waiting for an invitation, she stood up and walked straight to Ken's truck. She took the initiative to sit in the back seat, her face solemn, and she said nothing to Ken. The boss got into the truck also. She patiently started a conversation with the girl, in the hopes that she would recognize what the girl needed. The quiet atmosphere in the truck, on the other hand, made the two nervous. The truck became cold and thrilling as a result of the strange girl's presence. To avoid making this girl feel uncomfortable, the boss politely asked her for her address so Ken could drive her home first. The girl did not respond, instead silently pointing to the dark space in front of the truck window and remaining silent. Following that, Ken started the engine and decided to follow this girl's instructions. He kept an eye on her because her expression and gestures appeared shady. Ken let the truck turn onto a narrow road with luxuriant weeds on both sides and no one or house lights to be seen. Seeing that lonely road, the boss inquired about her exact home address, but she still did not respond. Ken held all of a sudden before he realized what was going on and what this girl truly required. The boss asked Ken what was wrong, then she looked ahead at the dense fog in panic. The fog was thickening and covering Ken's truck. The temperature was also colder than it had ever been. Ken took a deep breath and drove slowly through the dense fog. But the deeper he went, the colder and darker the air became. Ken looked worriedly at the boss, perplexed as to why there was such a thick fog in the middle of the summer. The boss, on the other hand, remained calm and told Ken to keep driving and take advantage of the fog to get home. Ken was startled again after a short distance of driving. In front of his truck, there seemed to be a group of people who appeared in the fog with dark and unidentified shapes. Another group of people began to arrive from afar, and the road became even stranger than before. The boss intended to ask these people for directions. But when she looked outside, she noticed that they appeared so strange with a worn and mysterious gait. Ken was intrigued by the boss's sudden trembling. He turned to ask his boss what she was looking at outside and discovered some weird things as well. In that dense fog, a crowd of people young and old, man and woman appeared out of nowhere. They had white eyes, no irises and looked like zombies. The boss quickly closed the truck window and crouched inside because she was certain they had encountered ghosts. Ken was befuddled right now. He didn't understand how he could get lost on this path. Seeing how urgent the situation was, and knowing that continuing on this road was impossible, the boss immediately told Ken to turn the car around and take another route. The boss just remembered there was a girl on the back seat. Maybe she could show them the way out. <laughs> But just as the boss was about to turn around to ask the girl, the girl sitting behind her burst out in a horrible, creepy laughter. The girl's face instantly changed into a ghostly smile. Both Ken and the warehouse owner seem to be caught in a trap that has been set for them, with no idea how to get out of it. The scene outside had changed slightly at this point. Those strange people abruptly changed course and gathered around Ken's truck. Some people were standing close to Ken's truck window, revealing terrifying ghostly faces. They howled like wolves and bared their fangs, as if they wanted to devour the boss and Ken. The others were also present right away groaning and shaking Ken's truck incessantly, making him extremely terrified. Ken was aware that he had encountered evil spirits at this time, 
and he wanted to start the engine, but the truck would not start. The boss panicked, looked down at the girl sitting in the back of a truck, terrified and enraged, and howled loudly at her. This young girl abruptly raised her head and gazed at the boss with a soulless, expressionless sight. Then she transformed into a small, cold whirlwind that swirled around in the truck. The back door opened and the girl vanished in a brief moment. They were both stunned and then slowly regained their composure and looked at each other as if they had realized something. The boss looked out the window at the same time. Outside, the fog had dissipated, as had the evil spirits. The boss looked at Ken in horror, thinking that those ghosts were most likely looking for the girl. Ken quickly drove the truck back to the village to ensure safety. Ken's friends panicked after hearing what he had to say and asked him about what he was going to do next. Ken developed a bad fever after returning home. Then, through research, Ken discovered that it was the souls of a big family who was involved in an accident in that foggy area. Anyone who ever crossed that path would also be harassed and scared. My name is Nara, and I worked as a makeup artist. Since I had just graduated from college, it was difficult for me to find work because every position required experience. Following the recommendation of my friends, I went to see the funeral home director and applied for a job here to improve my skills. After talking with my family, my father advised me not to take the job because contacting the dead was not a good thing. I was a little hesitant in my heart, but anyway, the income of the job was quite good and I could comfortably practice on corpses. My workplace was a remote funeral home and it was my job to make up the dead so they could be properly buried. Due to the specific job that required someone to be on duty 24-7 and I was the only woman here, so my colleagues also worried about me. They did not schedule a night shift for me to work. When I first started working, I was assisted by my colleague, so I gradually became accustomed to the job. Many of my friends began to avoid me during the time claiming that I was eccentric for taking on the terrifying job. I had gradually gotten used to the type of work for over a year, and I felt like a brave and even strong woman who could do the job even at night. It was a gloomy evening, and when I left work, I usually cleaned my workspace to keep it neat and tidy. I was about to close the door to go home when I was startled by a sudden appearance that nearly made me scream. The girl immediately apologized for startling me. It was a girl around my age. She looked very shy with two braids. She wanted to ask me for a favor. When I asked her what she needed help with, she said she needed her makeup done. I was surprised because no one came to the funeral home looking for a makeup artist. So the girl said she was getting married soon and came here to ask for my assistance because she didn't have much money. The girl was also aware that bringing up such an unusual subject was a bit abrupt and she was embarrassed to say it to me. The girl was dressed in an old outfit. I understood that society still had a lot of difficult people. The girl simply wanted to show her boyfriend how beautiful she was on her wedding day. The girl then smiled happily when she heard that I was willing to assist her and kept saying thank you. Then I took the makeup box and followed the girl to her house. The walk to her house was also difficult. It took more than an hour to get there. When she invited me into the house, 
She apologized profusely for allowing me to walk so far, but I didn't mind. I started opening the makeup box I had brought and prepared to do the girl's makeup. At the point, the girl introduced herself as Hama. I took out the makeup tools. These were the tools for applying makeup to the dead anyway. I still had to consult Hama before proceeding, and she agreed. I started carefully applying Hama's makeup after seeing what she didn't mind. When I applied makeup, I could see Hama's nervousness and tension on her face. All of a sudden, I noticed a black bruise on her neck. I worked in a funeral home for over a year, so I knew exactly what the scar was. Sweat poured down my forehead. My face was pale. I trembled. My heart panicked, as if it wanted to jump out. When Hama noticed that I had abruptly stopped applying makeup, she inquired me curiously. I quickly adjusted my breathing and emotions. I resisted the fear in my heart and continued to put on Hama's makeup. But my trembling hands revealed my inner fear. Then, because I was too shaky and couldn't make up anymore, I stopped. Hama then showed me the typical black trace of a corpse on a neck and said, The trace scared you, right? Then Hama lowered her head, a sad expression on her face, and told me her story. Hama said that she really wanted to marry her boyfriend, but a heartbreaking incident happened. It turned out that Hama had a boyfriend named Sam for over five years and was about to tell his family that they were getting married. However, after learning that Hama was an orphan, Sam's parents disagreed. Soon after, Sam decided to break up with Hama. Sam said she could find a new partner, but his parents only had one child, him, so he didn't want to disobey them. Sam decided to leave regardless of how much Hama clung or begged, and Hama desperately fell to the ground, tears falling non-stop. Hama felt as if the entire world had abandoned her, and even the person she loved the most had abandoned her. Hama stood on the cliff, looking at the scenery in the distance, thinking of Sam, tears welling up in her eyes. She had not expected Sam to treat her so cruelly. Hama did not hesitate, but chose to commit suicide by jumping off the cliff. There was no longer a Sam, no longer love, so her life had no meaning. Listening to the end of the story, I thought Hama was so pitiful. My tears fell because of Hama's story and also because of fear. Hama was now enraged. Her eyes were empty and I could see maggots crawling around her eyes. When I saw Hama's situation at that point, I jumped back in fear, leaned against a wall and shivered all over. I closed my eyes and I didn't dare to look at her, but from her voice I could hear her angry mood stemming from her hatred of Sam. All of a sudden, the surroundings became silent. I secretly opened my eyes and kept praying for her to leave quickly. But as soon as I opened my eyes, I regretted it. Hama was standing in front of me. I could even smell the stench coming from her mouth. I wanted to vomit. When I saw Hama's hideous face so close to mine, I stiffened all over. The ghost then asked me to make her beautiful so she could find Sam. But I advised her to let go of everything. When Hama heard my statement, she became enraged and grabbed me by the neck. Hama's hand strangled me tighter and tighter and I felt like I was suffocating. Then she let go of her hand, saying that if I put on good makeup for her, she would spare me. After Hama returned to her original form, I suppressed my fear and began applying Hama's makeup. After putting on the makeup, Hama looked at herself in the mirror and smiled happily. 
At that moment, I abruptly felt that Hama was really beautiful. Just as I was about to beg Hama to let me go, she blew a cold blast into my face. I fell to the ground and lost consciousness. I didn't know what happened to me after that. When I awoke, it was already morning, so I sat up and looked around, discovering that I had spent the night in the morgue with the body on the bed next to it. I slowly approached and looked at the body bag. My face turned pale immediately, because it was Hama, and her face had been meticulously made up. At the point, I was reminded of what had happened the night before, and the fear in my heart returned. I tried to control my fear and quickly opened the door of the morgue and ran out. As soon as I left the funeral home and returned home, I called the manager to ask permission to stay at home in the day. Just when I was thinking about whether to change jobs or not, the evening news on TV caught my attention. According to the afternoon news, on the day of the wedding, a groom named Sam repeatedly shouted in an insane state, then injured the bride with a bottle of wine and then jumped to his death. I quickly turned off the TV, which gave me a severe headache, and of course, I knew who had done it. The next day, I decided to quit my job and applied for a position at a bridal makeup shop, hoping that I would never have to go through anything like that again. The incident happened in 2007. At the time, my friend Gunn and I were transferred to a new construction site in a small town. The two of us shared a dorm with a local named Key. In the evening, Gunn told a story about the woman. One night, the woman was passing through a cemetery because she wanted to go to the toilet. She stopped quickly. She panicked when she realized she was urinating on a grave. She went insane and bit her four-year-old son to death when she got home. Many people in the village witnessed her story and they thought that she was haunted. I had always been fascinated by stories about gods and ghosts, and I was certain she was possessed by the ghost in the grave. At the same time, on the other side, Key laughed loudly. Key said that Gunn just made up the story. Gunn's story had not been verified by anyone. I also had a question, Gunn only heard from other people, so had he ever witnessed the story with his own eyes? Gunn heard Key saying what he said was made up to scare people. Gunn was a bit unwilling. Gunn scolded Key and challenged Key to tell a true ghost story. Key saw Gunn angry. Key was a little funny so he asked Gunn if Gunn wanted to hear a true story. I paid attention to Key's voice. He appeared to be aware of something, so he stood up and told us. Key said that there were demons right here in the town. He stopped and said with a serious expression that someone raised ghosts in the town. I had never heard of it before. Gunn didn't believe Key's story and thought that Key was bragging. Key was excited after hearing Gunn say he was bragging. He said there was a pond west of the dam where there was a very strange guy with a ghost on his body. When Key finished talking, looking at our unbelievable expressions, he said he would take us to see the strange man at midnight. With the expectation of mysteries, we all eagerly waited until midnight to find out the truth of Key's story. At precisely 12 o'clock at night, the three of us went into the direction that Key had indicated to see if the man raising the ghost was real or not. The midnight weather was quite cold. Hey, it hasn't come yet. Why is it taking so long? Are you on the wrong path? Asked Gunn impatiently. Key was a local and he knew the terrain well, so we didn't ask much. Don't worry. We're almost there. 
in front of us, Key reassured. We took two turns in a narrow alley. The surrounding space was extremely quiet. The area had a lot of abandoned houses and they were waiting to be demolished. Key stopped and said, You see, the guy is living in the dilapidated house over there. Key, seeing Gunn's bewildered expression, asked him if he was afraid and if he was, it wasn't too late to return. Gunn tried to be brave. He continued to ask Key to lead the way. So we continued to approach the old house. When we reached the wall of the old house, Key stopped and told Gunn and I to stay behind him, signaling us to be quiet. The three of us leaned softly against the wall below the window. We couldn't hear anything inside. Key grabbed both hands on the window sill and stretched his head inside to look. Gunn and myself were also curious. We followed Key to the window to look inside. The light in the room was dim. There was no furniture in the house. There was only a musty smell. The smell mixed with a stench. There was a person in the room. He was sitting with his back towards us. The man just sat motionless and bowed his head. After bowing and sitting motionless for seven or eight minutes, all of a sudden the man started shaking his shoulders and he sobbed softly. The three of us were unsurprised. We only heard the man mumbling something very low. I thought the man might be mentally ill, so he sat around talking nonsense in the middle of the night. I was confused and turned to ask Key who was he talking to. Today was also the first time Key saw him. The guy left alone. Maybe he was talking to a ghost, but we just didn't see the ghost. At the same time, Gunn suggested us to go around the opposite window so we could see the man's face. Key and I agreed with Gunn's approach. We were all driven by curiosity. Because many houses were demolished, we walked carefully to avoid making any noise. Key was the first to stand on the windowsill to look inside the house in the direction. Since the window was facing the front of the man, we were afraid of being discovered, so Key went up first to see who the man was actually talking to. Key glanced into the room, his body trembling as if he had seen something terrible, and he almost cried out. Key became terrified and withdrew from the window. Gunn and I hurriedly asked him what he saw. But Key just covered his mouth with both hands as if he was about to vomit. Key turned to cover his mouth and ran away. He started vomiting. When we saw Key running away, Gunn and I became even more curious. We couldn't contain our curiosity. Myself and Gunn climbed up the window. Then we saw a scene that we couldn't forget ever in our lifetimes. The man's shirt was opened. The sound of bones cracking could be heard. The man looked thin. He was holding chicken legs in his hand. And there was a face on his stomach. And the face was eating the chicken leg in his hand with its mouth. The face was making a rustling sound. We saw a few bloody animal carcasses still scattered on the ground. All of a sudden, the face on the man's stomach stopped chewing. His face looked at me and Gunn with blood-red eyes. He spotted us. We screamed and fell from the window. The horrible image made us dizzy. As we sat on the ground, we forgot the way back. Catch them and don't let them run, a voice cried from within. The voice didn't belong to the man, so it could only have been from the face. I had never seen and thought that there would be such a strange thing in the world. Key was vomiting next to us. He immediately dragged me and gun away and we ran back to the dorm without daring to look back. The next day we told colleagues and the technical team about the story last night. Many people did not believe us. So they came to the old house again, but the house was empty. They only saw the corpses of many animals. There were some local people talking about the incident. 
They said the man had a strange lump on his stomach. Some others said he was possessed by demons. And at last, I still didn't know what he was. Today I'm going to tell you something that my father went through. In the past, in my father's village, there was a still custom called One Night with the Dead. At that time, the custom of this region was very respectful of men and despised women. The status of woman at that time was quite low. When returning to her husband's house, the woman often had to do hard work. If she did not do well, a woman might be beaten and tortured by her husband as a matter of course. No one had the right to interfere in other people's family affairs and no one could protect the woman. And of course, the woman's family certainly wouldn't want that to happen to their children. Sometimes the police interpreted the woman's cause of death as suicide and the husband's family would not bear any punishment. So, in the village, a custom was formed that was, for the first seven days after the wife's death, the village youth would tie the husband up and lock him up with the wife's body for one night. If nothing happened in the following morning, it meant that the cause of death had nothing to do with the husband or that the deceased had forgiven the husband. The purpose of custom was for the man to suffer some torture for his wife's family to calm down. When my father was young, his friend's sister married. After returning to her husband's house, she hanged herself a month later. So with the support of the brothers, they went to the husband's village and tied the man to perform the above custom. My father said that at the time the man was still very resolute and stubborn saying that he was very good to his wife and that she had mental problems, so he committed suicide. When the husband found that he would be locked in a room with his wife's body, he got so scared that he screamed and begged to be released. They left him with his wife's body. If he was fine the following morning he would be free. Before leaving these people turned off the lights and locked the doors. Suddenly the whole room was dark. Only the light of the moon shining through the window. The space was completely dark. Only the man and the hanging corpse remained. The husband's eyes were fixed on the corpse. A feeling of fear enveloped him. In this situation, no matter how brave the husband was, he couldn't stand it. He felt fear, his heart pounding in his chest, holding his breath and hoping for a quick morning. The wife's body was covered with a white sheet, motionless. Outside the husband's screams could be heard clearly. Until midnight, he was too tired to stop. But at this moment, terrible things began to happen to him. He looked directly at the corpse, his whole body shaking with fear. Suddenly, there was a sound in his wife's corpse. The corpse in the room suddenly giggled. Accompanied by a terrifying laugh, the corpse shook unceasingly and it stretched the white cloth. The corpse suddenly stood up slowly. Moments later, the corpse was standing upright with its hair covering its face and it was moving towards the husband. The corpse's legs had already left the ground and slowly rose. Slowly, the corpse was hovering close to the husband, like when hanging in the house. Despite her husband's pitiful pleas, the corpse drew closer and closer. A pair of white teeth opened and a pale face appeared. The corpse revealed a pair of bloodshot eyes, staring at the man as if to say something resentful. Immediately after, a more horrifying scene happened. The neck of the wife's corpse suddenly lengthened. Just like that, the neck stretched out nearly two meters like a snake and approached the husband. 
with a large pale face leaned straight in front of her husband. He stared blankly and couldn't move his body because he was so scared. The husband was sweating unable to make a sound, staring blankly at the body and waiting for the terrible thing to happen to him. The corpse of the woman did not speak but growled and stared at him with an increasingly angry and fierce expression. Suddenly, the wife opened her mouth wide and rushed towards her husband. The scene was terrible. Suddenly a scream rang out. The husband was so scared that he peed his pants. He kept begging his wife not to come near him. The people who locked him were peeking outside like they were watching a horror movie and the main character was the husband. Yes, they did not leave. They arranged everything to teach the husband a lesson as well as force him to confess what he did to lead to the death of his wife. The father's friend was smugly viewing the frightened husband inside. Suddenly he stopped when he heard a familiar voice from the group behind him. He turned back amazed and confused. Oh my god, aren't you supposed to be inside pretending to be the ghost? The friend of my father's friend thought that his cousin was pretending to be the ghost inside. But why was he standing with them outside now? After seeing their cousin still standing there, the rest of them were equally surprised. But the cousin was even more surprised. He took off his wig and said that the plan was predetermined that it was still half an hour before scaring the husband. It was too early. They were all confused and felt that something was wrong. So who was pretending to be a ghost and scaring the husband inside? The cousin at this time also scratched his head and said, Strange, isn't it? Do you think the ghost is real? At this point, these people looked at each other. They deduced that if this cousin was still standing outside, what they saw inside was the real ghost of his wife. They were all scared now, confused and didn't know what to do. Everyone's limbs were as cold as freezing, not daring to move. They slowly looked inside again. It was scary. The long neck of the ghost was threatening the man inside. Looking closely they could see that it was indeed a real ghost. And the fear was at its peak. They screamed and ran out of the yard. The following morning these people dared to come back here to check. The woman's corpse was still lying in the house and the husband had fainted from fear. The man then went crazy, crying and laughing and saying crazy things to get his wife's forgiveness. About 10 years ago, I went to a mountain village in the country as a trainee teacher after graduating from university. Although I had to go to a strange place, I was not alone because I also had a classmate with me. His name is Ben. The place we went to work was relatively backward. The school was a dilapidated two-story house located on a mountain to the west of the village. Because the village was backward, living conditions were not good and there were no dormitories, so we lived in a free classroom on the first floor of the school. Since there was nothing to entertain us there, we usually went to bed very early. Every night, I took advantage of the bed sheets and blankets. The hardest part every night was that I had to go to the toilet before going to bed. After making the bed, I grabbed the flashlight and prepared to go out. At this time, my friend told me to be careful when walking because it was very dark around here. 
It was quite deserted around here, so I also felt a bit scared. I turned to ask Ben to go with me for fun. But Ben said that he was very sleepy. He also warned me one more thing that in the village, it seemed that someone had just died. This thing scared me even more. It turned out that this guy was trying to scare me too. Ben told me that someone in this village was buried on the hill west of this school a few days ago. Hearing this, I didn't know why my friend was trying to scare me anymore. Regardless of what Ben said, I turned my head and took the flashlight to go outside. As soon as I went out, I saw that the surroundings were dark with no moonlight. Honestly, I was also a little worried. The toilet of the school was on the side of the road outside the school, nearly a hundred meters from the school gate. There were no houses around the school which was extremely deserted. But right now, in a hurry, I could only reassure myself and walk towards the gate. This place was different from the city. The night was extremely quiet, not even a light was visible. I turned on my flashlight to find the way and finally reached the toilet. Although the toilets here were a bit run down and old fashioned, it was always a great feeling to have the problem resolved promptly. After going to the toilet, when I stepped outside, I suddenly heard faint footsteps coming from somewhere. Hearing the movement, I thought Ben must have sneaked out quietly, hid outside the toilet and prepared to scare me. So I raised my voice, telling him that I had spotted him already. You're gone, I've seen you! But after I finished, something caught my attention. I immediately flashed my flashlight in the direction of the moving person. It was weird. Two people showed up. So it was not Ben. I wondered why the two of them were walking at night at this time and they didn't even use flashlights. The strange thing was that the height of these two people in the dark was not like an adult, but like two 12 or 13 year old children. Suddenly they stopped and slowly turned back. I felt a little scared at the time. I gathered my courage and shone a flashlight at them. The scene that followed made me jump. I found the clothes of those two very strange. It was kind of red, blue and very bright. I thought that maybe it was the local costumes here. I was surprised and kept asking questions in my head. Only now did I notice half of their faces hidden in the shadows, especially the two red lips which seemed very strange. And just a few seconds later, I was shocked by the terrifying scene before my eyes. The faces of these two suddenly became monstrous. They stared at me terribly. At this point they looked very lifeless. I realized that they were two paper people with eerie smiles on their gloomy faces. They were staring at me. Paper. Paper people. My mouth stammered. My face stiffened. I looked extremely panicked. Terrified, I slipped and fell, dropping both the flashlight and the toilet paper in my hand. The two paper people were still standing, smiling weirdly and getting uglier and uglier. That smile completely haunted me. I used all my strength and ran away for life. As I ran, I shouted that there was a ghost. After running for a while, I turned around to see if they were chasing me. Under the light of the flashlight, they were still standing motionless and looking in my direction. Their faces began to become more monstrous, their smiles downright terrifying. Hearing my screams from afar, Ben rushed to the door and asked me what was wrong. I rushed in and shouted that there were ghosts. Oh no! Paper! Paper people! When Ben heard me talk about the paper people, he was also amazed. Not letting him continue to ask me, I quickly pushed him into the room. Immediately after, I closed the door and locked it. After closing the door, my back was against the door, my feet fell to the ground and I started to gasp. Ben reassured me to stay calm and tell him everything. 
Ben, I, I saw two ghosts. At first, Ben thought I was pretending. But after he noticed that my whole body was shaking and my face was pale, he finally realized that something was wrong. Then he squatted down and hurriedly reassured me. Paper people! Paper people! I, I just saw, I saw two paper people! They, I, I... I slowed my breathing a bit and talked about what just happened to Ben. After listening to me, Ben was silent for a moment then helped me to the bed to rest. But lying in bed I couldn't fall asleep. I tossed and turned all night. My mind was filled with the bizarre scene. The following morning the sun rose and warm rays were shining through the window. I woke Ben up and went to report this to the village secretary. At our insistence the village secretary would find us a house in the village too. Although the new accommodation was worse than the school accommodation, it was in the village anyway, and I felt safer. Only later did I learn that a couple had died in the village a few days ago. The night I saw the two paper people were just seven days after their death. At the time of burial, the family burned down two paper dolls. But that night, I saw two paper people walking on the street. I have no idea what happened. That was also the question I still hadn't found the answer to. It happened when Boss Lu Feng was not yet a director at police headquarters 703. He lived in a small village. Before that he used to work in the army. But now he only ran a small business. One day the people in the village suddenly shouted throughout the village because someone had just died at the edge of the forest again. Everyone was shocked when they heard the news. Because this was not the first time someone had died. There had been several people recently. The villagers rushed to the edge of the forest to see who the victim was. All of them had worried expressions on their faces. The deaths appeared more and more leading them to believe that a serial killer was appearing in this town. After seeing the dead body, everyone was even more confused. Because this time and another person was brutally killed in the same way as before. His eyes, nose and mouth even his ears were filled with straw by someone. At this time Lu Feng also arrived. He was currently assisting the village chief in managing this place. Lu Feng said, Everyone stay calm. Stay out of the way for the village chief. The village head at this time could only shake his head. His heart full of bewilderment because another person was killed horribly like before. Because he had worked in the military, Lu Feng also understood the process. He asked everyone to disperse and not affect the crime scene. The villagers continued to talk about the murder. Everyone was anxious. Because this was in the remote countryside, the police often arrived very late. Finally, the corpse was transferred to the best healer in the village to do an autopsy. Lu Feng and the village chief anxiously awaited the result outside. After a while, the healer also finished doing an autopsy and called them in to have a look. The healer couldn't believe his eyes and didn't know what to say. So the healer called the two of them inside to witness the incident with their own eyes. After the healer dissected the body to examine the inside, all of them were shocked and scared. The inside of the victim's body was now stuffed with straw. The village chief felt that this killing method was too cruel. Why did they stuff the victim with straw like that? But the healer said, The scary thing here was that the straw grew from the inside of the dead person's body. It was not stuffed in by someone. This thing made them both suspicious. How could such a strange thing happen? The village chief thought that perhaps the healer had made a wrong prediction. The healer was angry, saying that he had worked at a large hospital for many years how could there be a wrong examination? 
After hearing that, the village chief immediately asked Liu Feng to investigate this case because he didn't know when the police would arrive in this village. Up until now, Liu Feng had never investigated murder cases, so he hesitated a bit but still had to listen to the village chief's words. That night, Liu Feng set up a patrol team to go around the village. Each person would hold a torch and a wooden spear as weapons, then they split up to look for evidence. The team kept looking for information like that for two days, but nothing happened. On the third day, while they were patrolling the entrance of the village, suddenly Liu Feng felt a severe stomach ache and needed to find a place to go to the toilet urgently. So Liu Feng placed a torch and spear near the rock, then he went into the bushes to solve the stomach. Perhaps because he ate a lot of seafood in the afternoon he had a stomach ache. It was comfortable to go to the toilet on time. While he was going to defecate, Liu Feng saw a black shadow appear from afar. It seemingly was dragging something. In the dark, Liu Feng saw a man in a robe. He was stuffing something into another man's mouth. And then the man waited silently. In the dim darkness, Liu Feng could not see the man's face. But a terrible thing happened. Straw began to grow from the mouth and eyes of the man laying on the ground. In just a few moments, they sprouted and fruited like rice seeds. After that, the man in the row picked up those grains of rice and ate them with delight. The then he left the man's body there and left. Everything happened very quickly. Liu Feng did not have time to react. He could only pull up his pants, take the torch, spear and chase after him. As soon as he caught up with the man, Liu Feng shouted and asked him to stop. The man was a bit surprised but immediately threw a white powder at Liu Feng. But suddenly a thick fog appeared in front of him. The fog was so thick that Liu Feng couldn't see everything. There was a shadow coming closer to him. As soon as the shadow approached, Liu Feng almost froze. He was not a human, but a straw scarecrow with glowing eyes and terrifying sharp teeth. After regaining his composure, Liu Feng took a wooden spear and hit the straw scarecrow directly. Taking advantage of the dense fog, he passed Liu Feng easily. At this time, the fog was so thick that Liu Feng could not see clearly, but he was always on guard not to be attacked by surprise. From behind, Liu Feng felt a killing intent. A dark shadow was slowly approaching him. Immediately, Liu Feng turned back to defend himself. A straw tentacle suddenly rushed out of nowhere. The tentacle began to wrap around his neck and squeeze. Now it no longer looked like an ordinary straw scarecrow, but on its body grew many straw tentacles like an octopus. Liu Feng was squeezed by the monster to the point of suffocation and couldn't take it anymore. Then suddenly, Liu Feng remembered the knife that he brought tonight. Liu Feng tried his best to pull out the dagger. After getting the knife, Liu Feng immediately cut off the tentacle that was strangling him. And very quickly, he turned back and slashed the monster with a deep slash that severed its shoulder in a large chunk. At this point, Liu Feng had the upper hand, so he raised his knife to prepare to finish it. He stabbed the knife straight into the monster's head and then gently pulled a long line to slit its head in half. Using the last bit of strength to resist, the monster threw white powder into Liu Feng's face again. Right after that, his mind was dizzy and he started to want to pass out. Knowing that he would not hold out much longer, Liu Feng tried his best to open his eyes. Liu Feng decided to hug the monster tightly to prevent it from escaping and repeatedly stabbed it in its back. The next morning in a dream, Liu Feng heard the villagers call him. He tried to wake up and saw everyone in front of him. In his arms, he still clutched the straw monster and his whole body ached. Everyone helped Liu Feng to sit up. He was still in shock from last night's events. So he looked back at the straw scarecrow lying on the ground. That's right. The knife was still stuck in it by him. The villagers helped Liu Feng back home and at the same time they also tugged the straw scarecrow to the village. Hearing the news that the killer was caught, 
the whole village eagerly gathered around to see. But when they saw that the killer was a straw scarecrow, everyone was shocked. So the village chief came to reassure everyone. This straw scarecrow had absorbed the moon's light for so long that it had turned into a monster. Then the village chief reassured everyone that he would perform a ceremony to banish evil spirits. Lu Feng was the person who directly experienced everything, but he also didn't want to speak up. After that, the straw scarecrow was burned by the village chief to destroy the disaster. After a long time, no one was harmed. But after that, Lu Feng rejoined the army and did not return to the village. Later, Lu Feng became the director of Headquarters 703. One day, subordinates reported to him the arrest of a secret agent soldier. The interrogation should have been handled by a separate department. However, they had no way of talking to the spy. They reported it to Lu Feng. Looking troubled, he also went there to examine the situation. But as soon as Lu Feng got there, the spy surprised him. He was the healer from that village. The strange thing was that he hadn't changed at all from before. Only now, the healer revealed that that year, he had researched and planted a seed in the human body, helping to stay young forever. But when he fought with Liu Feng, he didn't fight back. So he took the hallucinogenic powder to throw it into Liu Feng and ran away, replacing it with a straw scarecrow. After that, the healer was convicted of multiple murders and was eventually executed. The straw scarecrow incident that year was also classified as a secret case. This morning at the branch office was very busy. There were many large and small cases, but they were mostly resolved. Suddenly someone ran in in a hurry as screams echoed throughout the hallway. His expression was so frightened and panicked. He rushed to a policeman and started telling everything, but he was so scared he couldn't say anything clearly. He kept repeating that they were zombies, they were corpses, they could kill people. The policeman led the man to meet the boss Lu Feng. The policeman rushed inside to report everything to boss Lu Feng. However, the witness was so frightened that he couldn't tell all of it. But based on what his ramblings were, the suburb seemed to be having some kind of mysterious problem. Without hesitation, Boss Lu Feng immediately ordered the first platoon to get ready with vehicles and weapons to reach the reported destination quickly. Following the instructions of the witness, the team soon arrived at a large cemetery outside the suburbs. The team needed to walk inside, led by Boss Lu Feng. The man was still panicked but calm enough to lead everyone to the location of the incident. The cemetery was huge, so the team had to walk for a while to reach the place where the stories reported about a zombie happened, but in front of them instead was a dead human body. Boss Lu Feng quickly ordered the forensic team and the investigation team to examine the body. As soon as the forensic team approached the body, both the team and the boss Lu Feng were amazed. In the end, what could happen to a victim that could cause such a horrible death? The first step of judgment, the victim was a middle-aged man who was probably the one visiting the grave, and the cause of death seemed like he was scared to death without closing his eyes with a face frozen with fear. After checking the surroundings for a while, the team also found a fairly new discovery, so they rushed to report to Boss Lu Feng. There was a very suspicious fallen tomb. The policeman reported to Boss Lu. Boss Lu Feng ordered a thorough examination of the entire cemetery and around the other graves where they should not leave any small details uninvestigated because this case consisted of many strange and suspicious things. Arriving at the headquarters waiting for the witness to be calmer, the policeman asked again for more details about what he had seen. 
The witness was very stressed and confirmed that this case was not caused by humans but rather certainly related to what he saw. The policemen were also amazed and still thought that he was still very frightened because they were sure to find something if this was the case. The policeman then reassured him and asked him to explain everything in detail one more time. Last night, he went to the cemetery as always to worship his ancestors and burn gold and silver banknotes for his wife. It was around 11pm. While burning incense and saddened by his wife's death, he suddenly heard a murmur like someone was talking. He was curious because there was no one when he entered here a while ago. But he heard so many voices at that time. He turned back to take a closer look and the thing in front of him shocked him. The screams were heard throughout the graveyard but it was too late that no one could listen to his calls for help. In front of him was a zombie. Just like in the zombie movies its teeth and fingernails were so long and gruesome it slowly started coming towards him. He was so frightened that he urinated in his pants while trying his best to run away. But as he turned, he bumped someone's leg. Before he could muster himself up, he looked up hoping that someone would come to save him. But what he had bumped into further frightened him. In front of him, now, was another zombie with the looks of a woman. He used up his courage to pick up a log from the ground to defend himself. But he was surrounded by zombies. They multiplied and surrounded him. In a panic he repeatedly swung the log to protect himself and found his way out. The claws of the zombies were highly sharp, injuring his face. But after a while of struggling he escaped and immediately went to the police station to report the incident. He firmly asserted that he was not lying with panic on his face, even though it seemed unbelievable. The police officer who took the testimony quickly showed it to boss Lu Feng and said that the witness did not seem to be making the story up. Boss Lu Feng pondered for a bit and then ordered to find the cemetery guard to investigate more clues. Then they rushed to their destination where the cemetery guard always lived in a small house next to the cemetery. The guard was a middle aged man with a sad face. After briefly listening to the police about the case, the man said that lately he has often heard many strange noises coming from the cemetery. The policeman carefully took note of the old man's testimony. As he spoke, the older man looked towards the cemetery. He said that he had seen strange things, many zombies wandering around the cemetery, but he just thought that he was all dizzy and hearing imaginary things. Then he took the policeman to look around the cemetery again. Then suddenly there was something very strange that caught the attention of the policeman. A tomb had been broken yesterday morning, but today it was set up neatly. But according to the cemetery guard, this tomb has not been cared for in a long time. After taking the information in for a while and looking around, the detective returned to report to boss Lu Feng about the situation. After hearing about everything, Lu Feng was very angry, thinking that someone was pretending to be evil to harm others. So he made orders that night to silently enter the cemetery to investigate. That night at the cemetery, the atmosphere was terrifyingly quiet. Captain Chow and his teammates soon led an ambush throughout the cemetery and eventually a suspicious person appeared. Captain Chow silently watched the suspicious man because he did not look like visiting the grave. Just a moment later, he turned in another direction. Captain Chow hurriedly chased after him. He could not see anything except for a grave in front of his eyes. Right now he suddenly heard horrible voices and howls. He glanced back to see what was going on. Behind him was a large group of zombies. They were pale and had long claws slashing out while slowly approaching him. On reflex, Captain Cha took out his gun and shot at an oncoming zombie. By this time his teammates came to assist him right on time and everyone also found out that shooting at them didn't really work. Captain Cha was unconvinced if they were real zombies because there's no such nonsense that exists in the world. After a long struggle, they still showed no sign of stopping but only continued to attack, getting closer and closer. Immediately, Captain Chow ordered to capture all of them. 
he did not believe that in this world there were things such as zombies. After capturing and cuffing them, Captain Chow discovered something behind the other tomb. There seemed to be some kind of strange movement coming from there. He had immediately rushed to get behind the tombstone only to discover the man he watched earlier intending to escape. As soon as he popped his head, Captain Chow pointed his gun at his head. It turned out that below this grave was a cellar and so the suspicious man had been captured. After arresting the man, Captain Chow went down to the cellar to inspect. Underneath the basement he found cages and signal transceivers. At the police station, interrogating the strange man, he said he was the old guard of the cemetery because without education, he had no home. So the cemetery guard had a house to stay in, and the salary was relatively high. He was delighted with it, but because he was lazy, he was kicked out. At some point, he discovered that these homeless people had strange diseases and moved like zombies, and most had even lost their awareness. He confined in them under the fake tomb that he created and then told them to scare anyone who would get near the cemetery. But unexpectedly all of this caused death. The homeless people were taken into the headquarters private emergency room by the Boss Lu Feng. Boss Lu asked the doctor about the conditions of these homeless people. Through initial diagnosis, the doctor said that they had strange diseases causing their brains to be eroded. This disease is contagious and makes people move like zombies. Then Boss Lu told the doctor that these people should stay here for research. They could not be released, otherwise they would be a problematic pandemic. That afternoon at the police station, the subordinates also brought the man who had the plan to Boss Lu Fang. He pondered for a long time and decided to deal with the other man for his crimes. Finally, the case was closed. Boss Lu told his subordinates to notify the press that there were no zombies or corpses. The case was also marked as a top secret case and listed in the issues that need to be monitored by the police department. This strange thing happened in a small village where I lived. In the middle of my village, there was a well that was used by the whole village. The water was very close to the well's mouth, so it was very convenient for people to get water. In the past, this well was used by the whole village to get drinking water, but later it seemed that someone drowned, so even though the body was recovered, the villagers never dared to drink the well water again. However, because the well's water was very clear and still as sweet as before, most people in the village used well water to wash vegetables and wash clothes. This well could be considered the most vibrant place in the village. It was also an ideal place for our children to play. Back then, when we played water guns in the groups after school, the water gun was made by ourselves using bamboo tubes and wooden sticks. Water was continuously pumped into the gun from the well. Every time I played water gun with my friends, when I came home my mother scolded me. My mother didn't like me playing near that well. And that day, because I was so happy with my friends, I played games all afternoon. My whole body was drenched, so I could only bow my head to apologize for my mother with an attitude of remorse. Although I admitted my mistake on the surface, I didn't mind it at all because we had a lot of fun playing there together. At that time, my family lived with my grandmother, who spoiled me very much. Every time my mother scolded me, my grandmother was always there to protect me. I used to come home late many times. But that day, my grandmother was really worried when she heard me going to the well to play. She started pulling me down next to her. Then, she told me a strange story that happened at that well. My grandmother told me that in recent years, people often saw a female ghost at the well. 
It was said that the female ghost was looking for a replacement. It all started about 10 years ago when a woman in the village took a son down to the well to wash clothes. That child was about my age but he hadn't been to school yet, so he followed his mother to the well every day. That day the woman was doing laundry at the well and the child was playing with a ball near the well, watching the child play happily. Then, when the woman soaked all the clothes, she discovered that she forgot to bring washing powder when she left the house. Because her house was close, the woman let her son play at the well and then ran home to get washing powder. But then, unexpectedly, a sad thing happened. When the woman returned to find her son no longer playing at the well, the boy quickly disappeared without a trace. The mother panicked, worried and ran to find a child in vain. Although she looked for him everywhere, she couldn't find her son anywhere. At this moment, she suddenly felt a strange feeling coming from the well as if something urged her on. The mother's hunch told her that something bad happened at the well. The woman looked back over the top of the well and suddenly saw a ball floating in the water. That was the ball her son was playing with just now. A bad feeling suddenly appeared in the woman's heart. She seemed to have a bad premonition about her son. She quickly ran to the mouth of the well. When the woman was in front of the well, she looked down and found her son lying at the bottom of the well. The woman saw her son below. She did not have time to think and jumped down immediately. But by then her son had long drowned and the woman could not swim. Not only was she unable to pick up her son's body, but the woman was also helpless in the well. So the woman and the child both sank into the well. When their bodies were found, it was already the next day. From then on, no one dared to drink the well water. Some people even heard the cry of a woman at the mouth of the well at night because their mother and son died unjustly. After my grandma finished telling this story, I cried at that time. I didn't know why I burst into tears. Maybe I thought that woman and her son were pitiful. My grandmother kindly told me that if something happened to me, everyone would be sad and heartbroken like that woman. That was why my mother told me not to go out there anymore. <laughs> After hearing the story about the well, I was scared and I didn't go there for quite a while. Until one day, my friends invited each other to play a water gun game. Both of my friends chased each other and played happily and I felt a little confused. So a guy jumped in and shot water at me which pissed me off. So I decided to get a water gun and go to the well to pump the water in and start fighting with them. But when I was pumping water, I suddenly noticed a colorful ball floating on the well surface. That ball was pretty. It caught my attention. The ball was very attractive when gliding back and forth on the well surface. I didn't know what I was thinking at that moment and I tried to reach out for the ball. The ball seemed to prevent me from catching it intentionally. It moved away from me a little and it just drifted away. So I leaned forward forcefully. Suddenly I slipped and my body lost its balance. I fell into the well suddenly, it all happened so fast. I fell into the water before I could call for help. The deeper I sank, the narrower the well, I seemed to lose consciousness. After a while of wobbling, I finally turned around. But at that time I couldn't swim and choked on some water. I just felt my body getting heavier and heavier. I was afraid to struggle but instead of rising I was sinking more and more. Slowly my eyes began to darken, my mind went blank. At this crucial moment I suddenly felt a force lifting me from under my feet. At that time I was still awake. I opened my eyes wide and saw that it was a woman coming up from the well. She hugged my legs and kept pushing me up. Immediately after my whole body emerged from the water, I tried to inhale for air. 
I panted, clutching the side of the well and slowly climbing up. When I looked back into the well, I saw no woman at all except that below the well was deep water. I didn't know where my friend and the others went. I finally got out of the well and ran home in a soaking wet body. When I got home, I didn't dare say that I fell into the well. My mother thought I was playing with water guns again, so she scolded me even more harshly. But in my heart, I was still very scared. I couldn't hide my thoughts. That night before I went to bed, I told my grandmother the whole story. I told the story clearly that today I accidentally fell into the well. When I was about to drown, a woman at the bottom of the well saved me. Grandma said back then the woman felt guilty for not being able to save her child. And today, she got to wish. She didn't want any more parents to lose their children because they would suffer as much as she did. I couldn't hold back my tears. That poor woman who saved me today made me feel less fear and feel more sorry for her. I had a strange dream that night. I dreamt that the woman and her child were playing happily. It was good that now they could be together and be so happy. Motherhood was truly sacred. This is a horror story that happened to a girl named Sugi and her dorm friends. Sugi used to have a happy family. However, her father often beat her mother and her because of drinking and gambling. Since then, Sugi's personality had become quieter. As time passed, Sugi went to a vocational boarding school and stayed there because of the difficult family situation. She was registered here by her mother in order for it to be convenient for both studying and traveling. The documents and procedures were quite simple, so Sugi would move in immediately. Sugi followed the instructions, brought the luggage to the school dormitory to prepare to clean and rest and the next day she would start the first day of school. The room where Sugi lived included four bunk beds for four people. Sugi and her roommates quickly got to know each other and befriended each other. That night, as everyone in the room fell asleep, only Sugi could not sleep because of the strange place. In the middle of the night, Sugi was awakened by the aimless singing of a female roommate. The loud singing caused not only Sugi but also the other friends sleeplessness. Yoko was woken up, so she turned on the light in annoyance. It was the singing of Anna, a female friend lying in the corner of the room, opposite Sugi's bed. To avoid being punished by the supervisor, Yoko quickly turned off the lights. Then the whole room approached Anna, asking what was wrong with her. But how to ask? Anna still refused to answer, just singing idly. After a while, Anna burst out laughing like a madman. Anna's hair at the time was messy like a crow's nest. The inherent pink skin also suddenly turned pale. Pale like an anemic person looking very scary. Then Anna suddenly stood up and went straight to the dressing table. All evening no one spoke to Anna. Whoever talked to her did not respond just sitting in front of the mirror singing nonsense like a madman. Sugi saw Anna like that. She couldn't hide her bewilderment and approached Anna and advised her to go to sleep. But when she saw Sugi standing near her, Anna's body suddenly trembled, laughing a few times, looking terrible. Her eyes rolled back to the ceiling. At that time, people in the room saw Anna like that. Everyone panicked thinking that Anna was sleepwalking. Sugi immediately grabbed Anna's shoulder to try to wake her up. Anna suddenly fell down on the bed in front of her friend in the room. 
A few seconds later, Anna's eyes widened, foaming at the mouth, and her whole body twisted and looked very scary. Sugi was looking at Anna at that time, and also showed panic. She thought it was because of herself that Anna was like this, so she frantically called the others to take Anna to the school's medical room. Sugi and her friends in the dormitory hurriedly carried Anna on their backs and ran straight to the school's medical room. On the way, suddenly Anna woke up. She blankly looked at Sugi and her surroundings, not understanding what was going on and why she was brought here. Sugi also quickly dropped her friend to the ground. After that, Anna and the others also returned to the room. Anna sat among all the friends in the dorm, telling all the strange things she had encountered before showing strange expressions like earlier. Before going to bed, Anna sat at the table and brushed her hair, but for some reason after that, she fell asleep and she was no longer conscious of anything. But this happened over and over again with Anna. Not only her, but everyone in the room felt fear for that. Anna couldn't take it anymore, so she applied for a leave of absence from school and moved to another place. A long time later, Sugi's dorm room also had a new friend moving in. She thought everything was over, but unexpectedly something strange happened. In the middle of the night, this girl also went to the mirror, acting exactly like Anna before, looking very strange. At this time, Sugi's new friend was sitting in front of the mirror, eyes wide with ghostly appearances and black lips that looked like a corpse. Sugi and the friends in the room who witnessed the scene could only fear but did not dare to wake her again for fear of the same situation as Anna. After a while, this girl kept rolling on the bed, sleeping soundly as nothing happened. Everyone in the room then turned on the lights. Sugi went to her friend's bed and woke the girl up. The girl didn't understand what was going on, bewilderedly looking at everyone standing around the bed looking at her, then asked Sugi why she woke her up at this hour. Sugi then told her friend about the strange incident she had met, but the girl still insisted that she had never sleepwalked. Because Sugi felt worried and suspected that the room she was in was something scary, Sugi went to ask people around if there had been many people who had a similar situation before. But the people in the area were not as friendly as she thought, especially when they heard about her dawn. Everyone started shouting loudly sending her group away, refusing to talk. Things could not find a solution, so the members in the room became even more tired. After everyone in the room experienced this feeling once, Sugi was the next victim. That night while she was sleeping, she was suddenly woken up by a voice. Sugi clearly sensed that someone was looking at her, so she ventured to glance to the side and see a big black shadow. She jumped all over herself, rolled her eyes at the black shadow in front of her. Her mouth opened as if she wanted to call her friend, but then she couldn't do anything. After a while, Sugi felt sleeplessness creeping in on her. She couldn't feel or control anything anymore. The black shadow immediately moved to the side of Sugi's bed. The cold air and the stench of the corpses rose strongly. Then, this ghost immediately stretched out its thin bony hand, step by step touching Sugi's body. Sugi opened her eyes and the face of this ghost appeared clearly for her to see with bright and white eyes. Moments later, Sugi began to sleepwalk. She started to sit up and get out of the bed. Then Sugi went straight to the dressing table, picked up the comb in front of the mirror. The image in the mirror reflected the hand of someone other than her. Luckily, Sugi woke up, looked back at herself, feeling a little tired. She glanced in the mirror to see what was wrong. Suddenly, Sugi saw that the person in the mirror was not herself at all, but a certain woman who looked very scary. Sugi turned around in a panic to take a look and saw the woman in the mirror brushing her hair. She immediately ran to the bed, her whole body shaking with fear. 
the friends in her room were awakened. They also approached Sugi and wondered how Sugi was able to get out of a sleepwalking situation. It was only then that Sugi realized that the other people in the room looked at her. They knew what was wrong with her and then woke up from her sleepwalking quickly. That night, Sugi's whole room stayed up all night. Everyone in the room sat together by the window. They told everything they had seen and everything was exactly as Sugi saw it. There was a friend in the room who couldn't hide her curiosity, so she discussed how to fight that female ghost. Sugi realized that the thing that helped her wake up was the treasure that her grandmother left behind. It was a pendant made of marble with a very large Buddha image engraved on it. She looked at the pendant, childhood memories returned to her once more. When she was young, her grandmother gave her this pendant, telling her to always carry it with her as her amulet. After that incident, Sugi was so obsessed that she couldn't sleep and the other friends in her room also moved out. Sugi had to leave too. Staying in this room was too dangerous. After applying for leave, Sugi stood at the beginning of the street, waiting to catch the bus to go home. At that time she inadvertently attracted the attention of the neighbors. A man who had been in the area for a long time next to her dorm approached. He told her about what happened in the dormitory she was staying in. In the past, her dorm room was the room of a female warden. Because she was upset about being raped, by the superintendent, she committed suicide in that room. Since then, anyone who had stayed in that room had experienced sleepwalking in the middle of the night. No one dared to say that they had met a ghost. Then they moved away because they couldn't stay there anymore. This terrifying event happened to my buddy Ben when we were in high school. We were also very close, so we frequently went out together. That day, Ben invited us to his house to play, but we were all so terrified to go. Just thinking about it gave me and my friends goosebumps. But when we heard that his family had recently purchased a new video game console, we forgot about our concerns. We were astonished and delighted to know that we would be able to play a new gaming console, so we immediately agreed and rushed each other to Ben's house. At the time, all of our families were farmers and Ben's family was the wealthiest. His father frequently bought him many excellent toys. Ben even advised us on the way that we should approach his house through the rear entrance because some things might terrify us if we went in through the front door. I was concerned when I asked him whether his father slaughtered wild animals to soak wine. That was a little harsh. Hearing this, Ben voiced his disgust with my demeanor, stating that it was his father's profession and that the more wild creatures that were drenched in alcohol, the higher the price they would sell for. Seeing that, we chuckled at the story and gradually entered Ben's house, and what made us not dare to go to Ben's house to play was his father, who worked as a brewer in a frightening style. The powerful odor of alcohol strikes in nostrils when the door was open, but something else drew my attention. It wouldn't be so frightening if Ben's father simply produced conventional wines, but he also produced wine from wild creatures. The wild animals were captured alive, placed immediately into the wine jar to drink the wine, and then drowned and perished, including snakes, pangolins, and monkeys. Ben's father even took owls and large geckos to soak in alcohol, and these wines were sold at exorbitant prices to the metropolis. After glancing around for a while, I got the impression that those wild white eyes were looking at me pitifully, which terrified me enough to close my eyes. 
but once we saw the gaming console we forgot about our fears. We had a great time that day and nothing bad happened. That helped us gradually get used to it all and stop being frightened of it. So we began coming to Ben's house more often. That day after school we went to his house again and there were a lot of people in front of Ben's house surrounding it. It turned out that Ben's father had captured a very huge cobra and it appeared that he wanted to soak it in wine. It was the first time anyone had seen such a large snake and it was found deep in the forest so everyone was intrigued and drew it back to examine it. The cobra glared angrily at Ben's father and everyone warned him to be cautious with large snakes like these. Then, as Ben and I went by, his father was ready to begin soaking the cobra in a jar of wine. Seeing everything made me a bit terrified, but then I started playing the game and forgot about the snake. Strange things began to happen all of a sudden. Ben's character froze and no longer moved. When I saw that I turned to question him and saw Ben with his head down making little coughing sounds. Then Ben's face turned purple and he coughed harder. His eyes were white and his mouth was full of water. He began to choke. His lips continued to spew something murky yellow and I began to detect a strong alcohol odor from him. It turned out that what came out of his mouth was booze, not water. I became increasingly scared and I was at loss on what to do. Then Ben collapsed on the ground, his body splayed out as though lifeless. He was twisting and turning on the floor like a snake, wine still flowing out of his lips non-stop and the image in front of me was horrifying. Ben appeared very weary after a time, laying on his back and motionless. I dashed to the yard to inform Ben's father because I was so terrified that I couldn't talk coherently. Ben's father had just finished soaking the snake at this point so he was still quite pleased and seeing me terrified he had no idea what was going on. I was now staring at the snake in the wine jar. It looked just like Ben. It also extended its jaws wide, became white in the eyes and twisted its body. This was precisely what Ben was experiencing in there. I didn't comprehend what was going on. My mind was a jumbled mess and I simply stood there. Ben's father came inside to see what was wrong with his kid at this time and I was still standing there in terror. Everyone rushed inside the house. Ben was nearly unconscious with a lot of alcohol coming out of his lips. People surrounding Ben claimed he looked like a snake being drenched outside by Ben's father at the time. One of them also warned him that if he didn't release the snake Ben would suffocate. When he heard that he ran out of the yard and quickly knocked over the bottle of wine on the table hoping Ben would live. The wine bottle shattered on the ground. Fortunately the snake was still alive. It remained motionless for a while before waking up. It crept directly towards the pile of firewood to escape after calculating the direction. Everyone who watched the event that day, including me, was obsessed. Since Ben stopped vomiting as soon as the snake was freed, but did not wake up. Despite his father's efforts, Ben remained immobile. Seeing this, everyone urgently requested that his father bring Ben to the hospital in order to rescue him in time as he was concerned that Ben would die if he continued to do so. Ben was classified as intoxicated at the hospital by the doctor because he drank too much alcohol. He slept for more than two days after that. I paid Ben a visit when he recovered consciousness and questioned him about what occurred that day and whether he remembered anything. Ben stated that while playing games as usual he suddenly detected a strong odor of alcohol in his nostrils. Then his entire body plunged into a large pool of wine. Struggling but unable to swim being further overpowered by alcohol. When he tried to look around he discovered himself in a lake surrounded by translucent glass. When he looked out he saw his father and many people laughing and pointing at him okay. as if Ben was shrinking. Ben felt the glass pane break just as he was ready to pass out from exhaustion and drowning in the water. 
Then I told him about the snake that his father had soaked in wine and left outdoors in the yard, looking precisely like what he had been doing that day. We were all terrified. Ben's father soon leaving the horror brewing wine business too. A few years ago, I opened a small photography shop on a street corner. Although the business was not very crowded, it also brought me a stable source of income. Every morning, I brought new photos, taking to hang outside the store to advertise and attract customers. However, the following days I sat at the counter, yawned and waited for customers. But still, no one came. One weekend, the doorbell at my shop rang. That was the first customer who came to my shop to take pictures after a sluggish week. Huh? I looked at her. It was a young woman with a slim figure and her face was also very pretty. I asked how the photo shoot was that she needed. This young woman was in no hurry to answer. Her slightly sad face looked at me, mixed with a little awkwardness that made me curious. I invited her to follow me deep into the set to briefly refer to the scenes and choose the right photography style. What surprised me the most was the decisive and cold answer of the female customer. She said she wanted me to take her photo like a worship photo. I looked at her in surprise, not sure if I heard wrong or not. Because if she was young, taking pictures of worship so early was an omen of bad luck and taboo that no one dared to do. I hesitated at first, hoping she would change her mind, but this girl was very determined. She really wanted me to take a worship photo. To please the customer, I reluctantly took her inside. As I walked, a strange idea flashed in my mind based on the suggestion of this female customer. I could open a death experience photography service. It sounded a bit weird, but it was also suitable for young people. But that eccentric thought was quickly forgotten when this female client and I went to the portrait picture room for the elderly. There was only one small chair in the middle of the room and around many large light catch lamps. I invited this female customer inside and sat on the chair to prepare to take pictures. I purposefully avoided taboo by telling her to sit in front of the white font like taking a card photo, but she refused and said she wanted to be photographed in the original form according to a standard worship photo. Knowing that I could not persuade the strange female customer, I immediately followed her advice. I brought the small chair to the blue background at the back of the room and prepared my camera to start shooting. I tried to focus, and my eyes fixed on the small lens. This girl's face showed tension, nervousness, and sadness inexplicably. To relieve her tension, I gently told this girl to smile, but it didn't work. Her expression remained as gloomy as when she first entered my photography shop. I helped her take a few more pictures so she could choose the best one. I guess she was overly stressed about the photo shoot so I tried to reassure her. After more than half an hour of simple photography, the shoot was finally over. I quickly informed this female customer and asked her to come back here the next day to receive pictures. Her photo would be finished by about the following noon. She softly uttered two words, Thank you, and then gave me a gentle smile. It was the only smile on a beautiful face since the morning. I carefully sent her out. I walked close to her so I could feel the cold emanating from her pale, slender body. She didn't say goodbye to me but just looked straight ahead and gently walked out. Her enigmatic silence puzzled me greatly. That night I remembered the returning photos appointment for the only female customer this morning, so I worked on the pictures until the middle of the night. But strangely enough, the pictures taken of the girl in the morning were all wrong. I tried to hold the photo in my hand. 
shined it under the lamp and looked closely, but could not find any clues to what damaged them. All photos taken of this girl were blurred, not clear and out of focus. Although, when I took the photo, I focused very carefully. I guess the problem was most likely in the reels that I shot, but no matter how much I searched, I found this reel to be perfectly normal and without any problems. That made me feel even more strange when I looked at the photo of the female customer in the morning. To fix it, I had to take a photo again, but that was completely impossible. I scratched my head awkwardly, trying to figure out how to explain when I had to give her pictures tomorrow. The next day she showed up on time. She was still wearing yesterday's red dress, but her face looked haggard and sharper. When the girl just came in front of me, I saw some dark bruises on her already beautiful face, which made me even more curious about the real life of this mysterious girl. She quickly asked me about the photo. Before the impatience to receive her photo, I felt extremely awkward and guilty. I didn't know how to explain it to her. The two of us fell into deep thought, unable to say another word. The girl always stared at me with expectant eyes, and I stayed silent. I slowly walked to the place that kept her pictures. My eyes couldn't leave her for even a second. Then I took the photo and put it on the table, mouth faltering. I tried to explain to her that there was a problem in the process of editing her picture, so I asked her if she could take another picture or not. She did not rush to answer my request, just calmly staring at the photo with sad eyes. The most amazing thing was that she didn't blame me for my skills, nor did she ask me to take a picture again. She said I framed it for her picture. I was happy to do that, immediately negotiating the frame size. After making sure this girl asked me to take the picture from back to her house and she would give me the money. Her offer to me was not too difficult so I readily accepted. After doing as she said I followed her home. She gently walked ahead and I calmly bought the picture frame behind. She took me through quite a distance, even crossing the highway which made me a little surprised and confused. After a while the two of us exited the main road and went to the edge of the forest. At that time, I felt a bit weird. I suspected this girl had bad intentions so I raised my voice. Faced with my suspicions, she looked very calm. She reassured me saying that her house was only a few hundred meters away. I agreed to follow her for a shorter distance. Arriving at an empty lot, she pointed to a large mound of dirt on the side of the road and told me to put a picture frame on it. I was surprised, thinking that she was joking with me, so I kept asking her again to verify if there were any houses in this deserted place, but the answer I got from her was always denial. This strange girl insisted that her house was on that mound and told me to put the picture on there for her. I seemed to have run out of patience. A whole day of walking was exhausting and it took no time to look after the shop, so I got angry and rushed to grab her shoulders. Only then did I feel the strangeness of this female client's body. As soon as I touched her, her flesh immediately seemed to cling to my hand and disintegrate. I was startled. I pulled my hand back to take a look and saw that the flesh on her shoulder was clinging to my hands. I shivered, slowly raising my eyes to look at the strange girl in front of me. That's right, the place where my hand was placed appeared a large hole as if it was gangrene. I gently stepped back, unable to fully articulate the identity verification question I wanted to ask her. When she saw my panic, she burst into tears and complained that her whole body was itchy and uncomfortable. But no matter where she scratched, I could hear the flesh falling right there. Her whole body was now white, her eyes were lifeless and crazy, her whole body gave off a foul smell like a corpse. After that, everywhere her fingers went, a row of tender, sagging meat looked horrible. 
I realized this customer was a ghost, so I screamed and ran away. I followed the trail and found my way out of the jungle. I ran to the police station to report this customer's story, and from there I also found a lot of information. As it turned out, she was a female student at a famous university in the city. It was also located near my photography shop. We went to her dorm and learned that her friends hadn't seen her for a few months. The police immediately contacted the family and immediately determined this to be a disappearance. From the clues and evidence collected from the police, the culprit was also captured. He was a guy who dated the schoolgirl. The two met each other through social media and moved in together for a while. Because he saw her asking for a breakup, he turned his love into hatred, killed her and buried her body in this mound of wasteland. Since that time, my shop had also become more gloomy and empty. Seeing that the business was not very good, I had to close the shop and find myself another job to do. In December 1989, the event occurred in Hong Kong's North District, which was an international municipality in the New Territories. There was an old restaurant called Krong Cha that specialized in various types of appealing cuisine, but generally only offered cha siu, rice and pho. Another day, Sheng, a young guy working at the restaurant, received a call to order food for four people including pho and grilled pork rice with eggs. It's at number C, building B in the Garden Plaza, isn't it? Okay, I'll deliver it to you right now. Cheng instantly grabbed a pen and notepad to jot down the address. He then proceeded to deliver food to clients. This address wasn't difficult to find, so Cheng didn't have to spend too much time to look for it. It was an ancient building. It was chilly and appeared like it hadn't been occupied in a long time. When he arrived at the correct address, he raised his hand and rang the doorbell. A blast of wind blew sending shivers down his spine. But the doorbell rang for a long time. No one opened the door and the posters strewn in front of the door indicated that this home had appeared to be abandoned for a long time. Sheng rang the doorbell many times more, but no one replied or opened the door. Sheng wondered if he had misspelled the address since the restaurant had been quite busy before. Thinking he'd been scammed, he turned his back to return to the restaurant. But as he did, a voice in the room sounded from behind Sheng. It sounded like someone was attempting to open the door. He thought he heard a voice, but it was foggy and indistinct. The door suddenly opened with a creak, accompanied by a terrible sound made Cheng nervous. The door was opened to expose a small gap, but the interior was so dark that Cheng couldn't see what was inside. The person inside only spoke in a low raspy voice and very slightly opened the door as though no one was permitted to peek inside. Then that person handed a banknote through the gap of the door. This person's hand was really odd. Even though the person opened the door slightly and placed the money outside, Sheng couldn't see who it was. It appeared to be a male. Sheng carefully examined the note. There was no issue. Sheng thought the man was strange when he instructed him to leave the meal at the door. That night, the restaurant was being cleaned up and getting ready to close. While auditing the income and expenses for the day, the owner noticed something odd. He huh? discovered a just paper among real money. He had no idea where this note originated from, but it made him feel extremely uneasy. Who is taking part in this game? 
Why is there a just baby here? Mr. Lee displayed the note to the employees and cautioned them. He suspected that real money had been switched for just paper. He tried to mention it aloud so that the staff wouldn't do it again, but he became enraged and tossed the just paper in the garbage. The next day, an order for dinner came from that address again, and they ordered the restaurant to serve them the same meal as yesterday. The owner promptly confirmed the order and asked Cheng to continue delivering. However, the situation with food delivery remained same from yesterday. Money was still given through the door gap, and food was still requested to be put at the door. The people inside were still not revealing themselves. Who did it? Do you think I'm a moron? The owner's voice continued to howl loudly. The reason was that he spotted a joss paper again at night. Seeing the boss was so upset, Sheng then informed him about the unusual food delivery to that address. For a long time, the owner reasoned that if the residents in that house continued to order meals from the restaurant, he would find out the truth. The next day, as predicted, there was an order from that address again. The owner personally delivered the meal to the location and received the cash from the door gap. He picked up the bill and carefully examined it, flipping it back and forth, but he couldn't see anything suspicious about it. The owner, like Sheng, placed food at the door. He hastily grabbed the money and departed, his face now full of contemplation mixed with bewilderment. Returning to the store, he placed the money aside this time to observe if anything odd happened in order to prevent the same misunderstanding as the previous two times. After the owner had completed calculating other income, he glanced at the bills in the evening. But what he saw shocked him. This occurrence terrified him so much that he dropped his cigarette and his mouth wide opened as if he had witnessed something awful. Those seemingly regular money notes he had placed in a different corner of the table had now been transformed into just papers once more. The owner was so terrified that he yelled to the police in a quivering voice. Police! It's me! Something awful has occurred. Please be here as soon as possible. Following to what the owner said, the police hurried to the location. But they discovered that the doorbell was entirely broken and no one came to open the door. The cops had to use force to smash the door down. However, once inside, they discovered that the door was locked from the inside but the horrifying image in front of their eyes caused them all to fear. There was a mahjong table in the middle of the room and some dead people next to it. They died in a big puddle of dried blood. These people had been dead for a long time and their corpses had shrunk, leaving just dry skeletons and their flesh had disintegrated. Based on the conditions at the site, they were most likely using a coal burner in the room to keep warm, but ended up inhaling poisonous gas. Because these people lived very private lives and didn't interact with anyone, no one discovered their bodies. But the empty lunch boxes littered throughout the room gave the cops pause because everyone in the room was dead. So who ate the food? These corpses were discovered and transported to the mortuary for forensic testing, confirming that they had been dead for more than a week, although the food in their stomachs had only been there for two days, which was rice and fur. The test findings astounded the whole Hong Kong police force. The dead man's fingerprints were also discovered on Mr. Lee's just papers. Soon after, this odd event traveled across Hong Kong and was published by various media outlets. The occurrence became a riddle that the police could not solve. It had become the Hong Kong's police sole publicly acknowledged super mysterious case in decades. According to the Feng Shui Shaman, 
the spirits of the dead could not leave the building where the incident occurred since there was no sunshine, so they constantly felt they were still alive, and sometimes people still could hear them. That room was filled with the sound of Mahjong players. In 2019, Ken and his colleague Kiba went on a business trip to the suburbs. Both returned home after finishing their jobs. Because of going away, and it appeared to be a bit boring, so the two found something to discuss with each other. So Kiba stated that it appeared to be the route where there were many rumors about ghosts. He looked outside, then turned to Ken. Do you believe the rumors about female ghosts appearing on the street? Ken turned to assure him that it was all a rumor. Besides, nothing had happened when they passed by there in the morning. When it came to ghosts topic, Ken was only now paying attention. It was true that the road was very dark and frightening at night. All of a sudden, Ken was startled and slowed down as he noticed a girl ahead of him walking slowly. The girl was dressed in a short skirt which resembled business attire. She had a slim body and walked slowly. Kiba and Ken had just seen the girl when their eyes lit up and Ken offered to give her a ride. Both sounded the horn to get her attention, but strangely, she still didn't intend to dodge the car or turn around. As a result, Kiba purposefully banged on the car door in order to make a noise and attract her attention. Hey baby, are you hitchhiking? There is a spare spot in our car here. The fact that she didn't react made Kiba a bit impatient. He leaned forward to get a better look at her. But all of a sudden Kiba was terrified. His voice stammered and his expression was amazing. At the point Kiba was almost speechless. His entire body stiffened, showing great horror when he saw the girl's face. It was a pale face. Black eye sockets and both eyes and mouth were bleeding non-stop, which was extremely frightening. Kiba was still trembling at the point, stammering that there was a ghost, even though Ken was surprised to ask what happened again and again. Kiba was still terrified, and shouted loudly, urging Ken to hurry up. It was a ghost! She was a ghost! Hurry up! Ken returned to take a look after hearing Kiba's statement. He was also bewildered by Kiba's demeanor. Kiba now continued to shout, looking extremely scared. Hurry up! She is chasing us! In the end, Ken reflected and asked whether Kiba was trying to make fun of him or not. Under Ken's scrutiny, Kiba did not appear to change his expression, remaining the same white and terrified face. Don't you believe it? It is a real ghost! Before he could continue, the scene in front of Kiba caused his face to change color. Ken also became aware of something unexpected at the moment, and he was taken aback. Both of them were terrified now. What the hell was going on? It was still the same girl. She appeared in front of the car, and because it was so unexpected that Ken couldn't control the steering wheel, causing the car to wobble. Ken struggled to keep his grip on the steering wheel, and the car narrowly missed the girl. Because it was right at the turn, it caused the car to swerve to the side and then to the other side, creating a very dangerous situation. After regaining his composure, Kiba breathed a sigh of relief. Fortunately, nothing had happened. Ken was also sweating at the time. It turned out there was a real ghost. She just walked behind and briefly appeared in front of the car. It was terrifying. The car sped up to a rest stop. Ken immediately stopped the car. Ken quickly got out of the car and urged his friend to pee. Having to meet a ghost made him terrified in order that he almost peed his pants. Ken told Kiba to deal with it quickly and got back into the car. Ken and Kiba stood a few trees apart. The space was quiet and cold. The surrounding forest was also extremely gloomy. 
probably because there were no street lights and the streets here were so dense that they blocked out the moonlight, making the place even darker and more terrifying. Kiba was comfortably peeing when he abruptly heard a noise from inside the forest. It was a long frightening howl. It was terrifying. It was the same girl from before. From afar she had a crooked gait. Her head tilted to one side as if her neck was broken. Eyes and mouth still pouring with blood. She was getting closer to him. As soon as Kiba saw her, he froze. His legs were stiff and he couldn't move. The girl staggered like a zombie. Kiba stood in fear for a few seconds. Then he held and dashed towards the car. Ken was leaning against the car, smoking a cigarette, when he noticed his friend running out with a terrifying face. He ran while screaming, There was a ghost! Ken rushed in and started the car after realizing that something terrifying had occurred. Ken then quickly stepped on the pedal and drove away. At the moment Ken and Kiba were convinced that the ghost girl was following them. Now even Ken was shaking with fear. They were both drenched in sweat, but their bodies were cold and shivering. The two were moving at breakneck speed, but the sight in front of them was incredible. Ken's eyes widened in surprise as well. It was her. She stood in front of the car, and by the time they noticed her and realized what had happened, it was too late. There was a horrible noise. Ken crashed straight into her. The force of the impact was so powerful that she was thrown very high in front of them. Blood was dripping like a broken water pipe, splashing everywhere from the air and sticking to their windshield. And in an instant, a long loose head of hair fell in front of the windshield. Her head was dangling from the window, staring them down. Her eyes became bloodshot and almost protruding. The mouth was wide open and it looked terrible. At the point Ken almost lost control. His hands could no longer direct the steering wheel in front of him. The car collided with a power pole on the side of the road. The power pole shook violently but fortunately it did not collapse on the car. The accident was terrifying. The first half of the car was destroyed and the window was shattered. Kiba then scrambled to get out of the car. He was heavily leaning on the ground as a fulcrum. But at the moment when he raised his eyes, a horrible scene occurred that haunted Kiba for the rest of his life. The female demon flew towards him from afar at breakneck speed. She opened a big mouth with a red tongue protruding in front of him. After the accident, Ken unfortunately died in the car. Kiba, on the other hand, was able to save his life because he was treated on time. However, Kiba now had gone insane and he was still haunted by the ghost girl.